Hey there, welcome to the Pseudo Show. This is Brandon. No housekeeping today. We're just going to get right into it. Neil, Bill, and I we got together to discuss the Linux desktop and what is currently impeding and also what is helping the Linux desktop adoption. I have a lot of thoughts on this and we get into it. Now I give you never the year of the Linux desktop. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash tux and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show. This episode is sponsored by Linode, now called Akamai Connected Cloud, a massively distributed edge and cloud platform. Sign up today at linode.com slash tux for a $100 credit and start deploying workloads where you need them with predictable price models. While you're at it, Take that credit and spin up a Linode virtual machine and deploy the Pseudo Show application of the month, N8N, an open source workflow automation engine. At Tux Digital and the Pseudo Show, we love Linode because they make it easy for us to spin up new services such as NAN and test them out. See what you can do with N8N and deploy it on a Linode virtual machine today by going to linode.com slash tux and let us know what you do with it in the forums. This is a topic I know we all really care about, Linux desktops and where where it's going. I know the title of this was a bit clickbaity. A little bit clickbaity indeed. A lot clickbaity indeed. Everyone keeps talking about the year of the Linux desktop. Oh, it's finally around the corner. I, I've been hearing this set really since 19, I want to say 1999. Let, let's start there. One of the first Linux distributions to really say this is an alternative to Windows, partially because it had what was at the time a fairly mainstream office suite, WordPerfect, Quattro Pro, et cetera. That was Corel Linux. That, of course, ended the way it ended. I, I don't think very many people remember it. And then there was this other time, like about 2004, 2005, maybe to 2008. This is a big push for consumer Linux, also enterprise Linux. This is the era of the netbook and also a lot of failures with, with Microsoft. They had Windows XP, which was a great release for, for them overall in the enterprise space. And then Vista came out and that was just... Well, I think everyone remembers that the system requirements for Vista were far above Windows XP. A lot of shops start looking at alternatives or looking at Macs, looking at Linux. I think one of the big reasons for the failure of Linux adoption at that time was the applications, the lack of an e desktop app ecosystem that were at least that were familiar. You didn't have a word perfect uh, where there was some familiarity in the 90s with WordPerfect, that was a very popular Office. Microsoft Office would run with Wine to some degree. And then you also had Internet Explorer only web applications. The ActiveX stuff. Yeah, all the ActiveX stuff. And I think that was a huge barrier. I get asked this, why, why isn't Linux taking off now? Everything is in a browser. You have Office 365, you have Google Docs. And even if you didn't have the online collaboration tools, Word, it basically in the Microsoft Word in a browser, you have only you Office. You have Excel in the browser. That's the big yeah. one, right? Yeah, Excel Excel well, in the yeah. browser. Having Vizio. Excel in the browser is a big deal. Back when I was working on a 
Windows to Linux migration. Physio is another big application. And now that also runs in a browser. And frankly, I don't even need to use Visio now. There's other tools that are just as good and in some cases better. Outlook for Windows is dead. Yeah. The new too. version is an Electron app. That's true. And also we have the Linux Office suites also have very good support for Microsoft formats. Only Office is a great mention here for that, as well as LibreOffice. Both are support them a lot better than they than they've ever had in the past. So what's the problem? Why isn't there any Linux desktop adoption? Some arguments that I've heard of uh, the desktop market is just uh, dying anyway. Maybe for in the consumer market, that's the Actually, case. So here I would actually argue the otherwise. I think that if you look at the consumer market, it's flat but not declining. And that's important. So like if you I think the the biggest thing that like flip that the PC industry was flipping out about was like growth basically like reversed this year from the past couple of years, which if to be honest, we all expected that. The last couple of years have been weird for the entire PC industry. The growth that they experienced did not make sense, but what is not happening is a decline. There is not a net negative occurring in PC deployments worldwide. So what's happening, I think, is because PCs have gotten good, tech improvements have become more incremental for the vast majority of people, you are seeing those lifetimes lengthen. And the businesses around PCs right now, like selling them in particular, they haven't reformulated to handle those longer life cycles yet. Like a lot of them are really, really holding tight to the fact that most businesses up until the pandemic we're doing three-year refresh life cycles. I know many companies switched to four or five-year life cycles during the pandemic because they just couldn't afford to maintain their regular schedule. I think when you take that into account, you can see where a lot of the perception, I think, is that the, that the PC space is dead. In the consumer markets, you have a split. You have the regular, I don't want to say basic tier, but like entry-level consumer tiers, like you've got your netbook your your netbook classes which have been re eaten away by chromebooks you have your your base tier laptop classes for ultra portables and stuff like that that people use for doing light professional work and then the you MacBook have the macbook air in that right class. the macbook air is a great example of this um the dell uh, the the dell xps then you have the gaming class like the lenovo legion and alienware and HP Razer Omen. and the HP Omen, right? And then you have the enthusiast class, which is a class above it. Omen also fits into this, but then you have like Dell Precision, Dell XPS, um, and you have Lenovo ThinkPad, which yes, I know most people would say, oh, this is a business class laptop. Have you not seen how rabid ThinkPad people are? Like they definitely fall into, <laughs> yeah, they definitely <laughs> fall into an enthusiast class all on their own. It's it's an accidental success for IBM and now Lenovo in that ThinkPads have gained such a following that people buy them just for the sake of it. Right, and they even uh, spend uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars on uh, even older hardware that just happened right. to be branded ThinkPad. Right, and especially when they have IBM printed on them too. To kind of complete what I was saying, these upper tiers, so you go from like the mid-tier ultra portables all the way up to the enthusiast tiers, they're seeing Linux adoption in the consumer space. These people have income, they're informed, or they, they have people advocating to them, and they have the willingness to try something new, to get a new experience, because they're frustrated with what they have, whether that's how Apple has become increasingly closed in Mac OS, or how Windows has become very, I don't know, like kind of close to malware with how they approach user interactions these days. Since since Windows 8, it's been an odd downhill trend for them. People are, are looking at this stuff. The fact that in the gaming class, we now have the Steam Deck, which is really showing that a Linux experience can work in the consumer market, I think we're going to see that bleed out into more of these spaces more and more. That said, there is a relationship, a, cor a, a correlation 
if you will, of interest in platforms for home and professional usage, especially with working remotely or hybrid work and things like that. And that's where things get complicated. Brandon, I think this is where you have a little bit of expertise because I think you've done this before. This is not your first rodeo looking at Linux workstations, desktops for businesses. The, the trick has always been, whether if we're talking when I did this 20 years ago, when I helped deploy Linux across an, an enterprise, the key here is management, especially today. And I'm talking not just enterprise class management, I'm talking even consumer level management. Today, I'll use Apple as the example. I can have a, whether if I'm using an Apple iPhone or a MacBook, I can track it. I can remote wipe it. I can, or I can lock it. If I, you know, if I, I can remote wipe it or lock it, if I lose it, I can also do that with windows. If I'm using, if I'm in the windows ecosystem. So on the consumer side tools for users to lock down their devices, if they lose them or, and wipe them. Apple pioneered this like I was about 12 years I ago. I was about to say that. I was literally there when it happened. And also when Microsoft to some degree has released tools to manage your kids devices. So from looking at it from a family perspective as well. Right. In Microsoft 365 family, I mean, one of the reasons that Windows, as much as I don't like it, one of the reasons that Windows requires an online account now to actually log into Windows is so that if you connect it to a Microsoft 365 family account, you can actually remotely control the Windows experience for a mm -hmm. child or for, you know, if you want to do things like the device wipe location tracking, you know, those, those, ba yeah. those basic things. Enterprise has all that, the control, especially today, back then device wipe was not a thing like 20 years ago. That was not a thing. Computers also didn't move. They, they didn't move a lot. I mean, you had definitely had people that did have laptops where I was working. Almost everyone had a desktop and a laptop. When you're dealing with desktops, like a de uh, meaning a device that doesn't move, so work just for the sake of clarity for you know, in the enterprise space, generally just called workstations, whether if it's just for a task worker or for or if it's a high performance machine, you know, they don't move. From a Linux perspective, it's easy. I have tools I can manage a workstation all day long, basically managing it the same as a data center device because it's not moving. Yeah, it's a little bit higher risk because it's in a cubicle versus a highly secure data center, but you're still in a secure building. You're still, it's still easy to keep it managed and keep it under control. It really just gets back to, like back in 2005, what were, what were we missing? We we're missing the application ecosystem. Today, we have it. Thinking about a familiar ecosystem, mostly thanks to web applications. Now we're behind again. This is a problem that isn't going to go away. I know there are some solutions, proprietary solutions that are trying to solve it. Intune is one example that can do MDM. But th again, this is that's more for enterprise and, and other businesses versus consumer. And really, that's what I think about all the time. I don't really think about the consumer space. We're at this point again where there's an adoption barrier that will prevent Linux from going into mainstream. It's a new adoption barrier, but an adoption barrier all the same. I think the difference this time is that we have a lot, a lot less companies that feel empowered and motivated to solve problems like this. 20 years ago, there was a lot more idealism. There was a lot more drive towards trying to make this a success. But 20 years is a long time. And for a lot of those people, they get burned and burned and burned and burned. And it wears on you. And it's very hard. There are some people that are still plugging away at it. And I hope that there'll be fresh blood to come in and plug away at it some more because this whole Linux on the desktop thing only works as long as there's people that believe in making it happen. If nobody believes in making it happen, it's not going to happen. It is all about belief. It is all about drive. And it is all about making it happen. It's always been that way for open source stuff. It's always been that way, even for computing in general. Like most computing problems get solved because somebody cares enough to solve. So let me ask you guys this. Let me ask sure. you guys this. You guys have talked about having the web apps and then not having the tooling. Now not now having the tooling, but not sorry, the web apps. What about 
a product like Collide, does Collide bypass the need for us to even discuss MDM because Collide is going to act as the gatekeeper between the user and the applications they need? Now, on the consumer side, it's very probable that that tooling could be built for a family. I mean, Apple kind of already does it with parental controls and Apple IDs and Apple family sharing. And Neil, as you said, they they pioneered it and they started that with OS X, which was when they created the Apple, I believe it was called- For those who don't know Manager. what version OS X Lion is. 10.7. That, that's important because- no- because remember, micro, Mac OS doesn't use cats anymore for the code names. They use mountain ranges in California. Mac OS 10.6 was the last version of Mac OS to have a monolithic server. And then when 10.7 came out with Lion, they started using the Apple Profile Manager, which basically all the settings were just simple XML files inside of Mac OS. In today's world, could a product like Collide replace or negate the need for all of this because it's acting as a barrier between a user and the tools they need. Now, granted, Collide is there for more of a compliance standpoint. Do you guys see something like that as the end game? This is the first time I'm hearing about Collide. I just had a, while you were talking there, I did a quick search. Now, it's interesting. It's very similar to, to Fleet DM, it uses OS Query. Collide has a very interesting approach, though. They plug into businesses that use Slack, and they use Slack as the interface for machine management. But they don't, they don't do it in the form of management. They do it in the form of using gamification, reporting, auditing, that kind of those tools. They try to use an incentive based approach to compliance, which is not a terrible idea. It's actually a really good one. And, and that actually might even work to some extent for many classes of problems, but it doesn't solve the core issue, which is how do you manage the computer? It's not designed to manage the computer. Managing the computer is not their goal. They're, they're, they're targeting people who are intelligent, who know their things. Like they'll even mention in blurbs about Linux. Yeah. Your average Linux user is probably going to be very snarky with you if you try to force things down their throat. And I think that is actually what informed their whole design paradigm for Collide in the first place. It's very neat otherwise. But when you're looking at like the problem space that's like holding some of this stuff back, I, I want to break it down into the classes of users here. So like you look at consumer and I think Brandon covered this quite well. Device wipe and location tracking are things that that people really feel our table stakes here. And actually with devices being increasingly mobile now, it's not unreasonable to have this. We have this with Android phones. Like if you connect it to your Google account, your Google Play account will actually let you remote wipe the phone. You can force on location through your Google account and then find it. You can make it make sound so you can find it in the real world. And if you can't find it, you can force it to be wiped. Android does seamless data encryption based on your authentication with your Google account. All this stuff. And, and iOS and, and macOS are very similar. They do the same stuff using your iCloud account or iMac account before that. I don't know what it's called now. I think it's called iCloud now. Then the next stage is like the enthusiast here, right? You got the gamers, you got the students, the developers. These are actually extremely important people because these people are the ones that turn into the makers and shakers. You want to have them like your platform. You want them to be motivated to do stuff on your platform and you want them to like what they're doing. Getting them is hard because, because it, there's no immediate payoff. It takes time. I, I've been in conversations with people before about this in, in all different places. And it's like, well, there's no money here. So like, how, why should we bother? It's like, you've got to follow the motivation. These people will take what their experiences are and turn them into requirements later. For example, that hobbyist, that developer, that student, they go out into the world after they graduate or whatever. And they'll take what they've experienced and learned and worked on, and they'll turn it into a requirement for their professional career. That drives future demand. It dev drives future growth. It drives future creativity and future, cre and future success. And then there's gamers. Gamers are special because gamers spend money. Gamers spend a lot of money to eke out performance, to be the best at what they do, 
to get the best FIPS, frames per second, to get the best audio, to get the best graphics, to get the best reaction times, everything. And they're tweakers and they're tuners and sometimes even programmers. Those people become very attached to their workflows. They become very attached to how they do things. Things don't have to work out of the box for any of these groups of people, but it has to be possible and it has to be available. This is, I think, where we are right now with Linux desktop adoption, because you have you have uh, the HP Dev 1 last year launched. It was on quite outdated hardware, to be honest, right? It was two generations old at that point. It was still good. It was it, it received decent amount of, of praise, adoption, purchasing. It sold out. They aren't selling more. I don't know what that means. So far, everyone I've ever talked to has been like super impressed with the device. And then you have Lenovo making ThinkPads since 2020, shipping Fedora Linux on them. That's amazing. And you can just you can just get them right from the from the Lenovo web store. Go to Lenovo.com, go search for Linux, go find a laptop that says Linux, and it probably gives you Fedora to as an option. Those opportunities are things we should nurture and grow. And having those things get out there, yeah, everything's not going to be perfect out of the gate, but we're getting there and the experience is getting better and people are clearly increasingly interested. And once we get over that hump, then there's the next stage, which is I think the part where everyone like kind of freaks out. This is the prosumer territory. In the prosumer space, the requirements are the same as the enthusiast space, except for one, everything has to work. Things can't not work. When things can't not work, that's a whole new ball game. And I would argue that up until very recently, we couldn't pull this off. Uh, but now you see we've got creative software being made for Linux, either ported to Linux or being made Linux first. You've got amazing things like OBS Studio, the open broadcaster software. You have Caden Live from the KDE project for video editing. Graphic design, there are a number of tools um, like Krita and, and Inkscape and Blender and things like that. Games, developing games themselves, like actually making them. All major game engines in use in the industry today natively run on Linux. As of like, I think last year, maybe the year before, I forget exactly when, all of them, you can do all of your development from Linux too. That's a big change because for a long time you couldn't. Yeah, maybe you could export to Linux to have it to play the game, but you had to develop on Windows or whatever. Now you can do all of it from Linux. Related to that, you know, you have specialty devices, you have high end audio devices, interfaces, uh, XLR, mixing boards, things like that. You have cameras, high definition ones, 4K ones, multi-view ones, 3D cameras. Yes, they're still a thing. I pretend that they don't. A big one that I know is important to a lot of creators is wireless cameras. Right. So, utilizing the NDI protocol, which is a low latency video a, wire, a network video protocol that works awesome on Linux. I, I know because I use NDI for uh, to get my phone to act as a webcam if I decide if I need if I need to use it. One of the most important yet not really discussed devices out there in the creative space is the Stream Deck from Elgato. Uh, that device now has a Linux-based interface. Somebody in the GNOME community went and built one. You uh, I think it's called Boson, spelled like Boat Swain. Don't ask me how words work. I don't have answers for you. But Boson has a complete interface for Stream Deck devices. And that means that creatives, content makers, and, it, and influencer types with the combination of OBS Studio and Caden Live and the and Boson and support for high end, you know, mixing equipment and video production equipment. And the fact that today, if you're using, for example, Fedora Linux or Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 or CentOS Stream 9 or related distributions in this family in particular, and even in like OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, Pipewire is now used, which means you now by default out of the box have high quality prosumer and even like business grade, professional grade 
AV pipelining capabilities built right into your Linux desktop that you can get for free with no effort. That's a big deal. And that's going to continue to drive growth in that space. That That's why Apple was so popular, well, not was, is so popular, is because of the audio and video stack. Well, not that, the audio part, but definitely the video part. Probably more so video. But that, that's why the Mac is so widely used in that, at least it's definitely in the video space. Linux, I remember when Pipewire first came out, everyone was worried that it was going to be what happened with... Um, with Pulse Audio. Frankly, Pulse Audio, depending on your distribution, was totally fine, depended on the implementation. And frankly, it's the same with Pipewire. It's going to depend on the implementation in your distribution. But based on my experience so far with Pipewire on my desktop, on my laptop, I know when I have an audio interface selected, it works every single time. The only time it doesn't is if I do something stupid. I think what Pipewire has allowed me to do is forget that I know about audio in Linux. It's always on. It always works with all the different devices that I have. I can manually select which audio device I want to input to or output from. And that's the only interface that I need to have with Pipewire. Other than that, it just runs. So for those professional creative audio, that barrier has come way down in recent years. I do streams on Twitch every once in a while, you know, playing games or doing software development or whatever. I don't have to do any work to map the audio that I want to have or the video that I want to have. I can take a pipe wire capture of audio or video and I can route it and pipeline it right into OBS Studio or into some other filter tool and then pipeline that into OBS Studio or do whatever I want. And that's all built in. And it's literally point and click. You don't even need to do any programming. That's a huge, that's that's not a thing anywhere else. Yes, we have all this really cool stuff. I think we have the technology on the Linux desktop, I actually believe, has never been stronger. 20 years ago, it was on par with Windows XP. I'm going to say it. It was totally on par. We had a desktop that was awesome, did a lot of really cool stuff that Windows and Mac couldn't do back then. And and then everyone caught up or they just did it better. Even if they didn't do it better, there was a better app for it. Now, I don't think we have to worry about that so much. Going to harp on this. It goes back to management, the prosumer creator type or freelance developer. If they can't figure out where their laptop is, if they can't remote wipe it, that's a problem. It, and it goes back to, to what we were talking about, whether if we're talking about Collide or fleet dm that only gets you so much it tells me what's wrong but it doesn't help me remediate in terms of policy like this is what those prosumer small business and enterprise want they want to be able to know is my laptop encrypted is my where is it am i at a specific baseline encryption uh, baseline configuration unless you're willing to deal with the limitations of utilizing data center focused management tooling. There is no way to properly manage a fleet of laptops or, or, or just, or a small fleet. Like for ta again, if we're talking like a uh, creators, like whether if they're small creators or large creators, they're going to have more than one laptop. They're going to want everything the same. There's got to be a good way of making this easy for, for enterprises and for that prosumer space that we've talked about. Do you think though, given the independent nature of Linux users, if they were told that their Linux laptop was being subjected to MDM requirements, do you feel like those prosumers with the knowledge that they have would maybe revert to Windows or Mac and on another device? Two reasons. First reason, if the company is providing them a computer, then the equation, the calculus for most professionals changes quite a lot. Now, if you're telling them that they need to do MDM to their personal computer, I don't care what OS you're using. That ain't happening. I ain't doing it. Uh, actually, one of the reasons why I don't like iOS devices is that if you do, if you, if your company does bring your own device and then it requires MDM for it, um, iOS MDM essentially hijacks the whole device. Uh, Android is considerably better because it basically creates a container of Android for your work stuff and sets it aside. It actually cannot affect your, your personal data. This is a feature that is so vastly underrated in Android. 
and actually is a capability that we should look at bringing into Linux proper because it's a very useful capability. And actually, this might be a thing we could do with, um, I'm going to say it, we're going to do it, ButterFS, because you can create, you can create clones, you know, basically you can take a, sub, a snapshot of a volume or create a brand new sub volume and initialize it and use it as an overlay on top of your main one and use that to store corporate data. And then that data could then be encrypted with whatever corporate policy you want. And then rest of it doesn't have to be. Now, technically, you can do this with anything, right? Like you could even do this with LVM, with LVs, if you do the correct mounting things. But but the big difference is that with ButterFS, it doesn't eat the space on both sides. That That's a, a good idea. So we'll, we'll fi- let's file that. Put it away. Put a pin but in that. I, uh, An- but- an- another, another idea, an- another thing we need to file the desktop applications, the, the applications, that the company applications. Right. They need a way to be able to deliver those. Yeah. In a container. Sure. Why not? I mean, actually, this is where... Flatpak. Well, Flatpak is one way to do it. And, and certainly, if actually, the fact that Flatpak supports private remotes makes this a very good way of doing this. But you could also do the same trick with, uh, even with like standard RPMs and devs. Again, the trick I was talking about earlier about creating like overlay file systems would work no matter what delivery technology. Flatpak just makes this stupid easy though, because if you adjusted the way Flatpak installations work, you could have them install into the shadow user profile. And those application data would just sit there as well as the application installation. And then you would tweak the desktop to do fancy things. These are all things that people are now used to when you look at a Mac device. I've borrowed corporate Macs before. I know what they look like. They do this. Android devices, they do this. Chromebooks do this. Chrome itself on every platform does this. Like for work, I have Chrome and I have Chrome for work. And Chrome for work completely exposes different settings, different add-ons, different corporate data, different encryption standards, different sync data standards, the whole works. And actually it binds to my Android for work account, which is super cool because all the data is kept seamlessly in sync in one place. This is the kind of stuff that people are now increasingly expecting. One of the other things I was that came up when you talked about encryption, whether if we're you know separate enclave or whatever we, we want to call it. One of the issues that I have with Linux. This is coming from a Linux user of 25 years. Yes, I've been using Linux since I was 12. So I guess it's more than that now. Wow. I'm you too? Old. Look, man, I, I feel old because like I started using Linux when the bubble burst. I was using Linux uh, before. Same here. 1996. 2000. I'm right in between you guys. 1998. And full time in 1998. Anyway, when I think about Linux, one of the things that drives me insane coming from that background is uh, the experience of handling an encrypted drive. I've used Macs for, for a little while there. The Mac, the Mac experience for handling encrypted drives, 100 times better than it is on Linux. I mean, it's not that bad on Linux. I mean, I type in my Lux password, my, and then my computer continues to boot, and then I log into my desktop environment, but I'm typing in two passwords. It's more so an annoyance. Prosumers, even if they're technical, see that be- being an issue. I do see it, in it as an issue. And one of the things that absolutely drives me insane is unlike Windows and unlike Mac, we don't utilize the security chips that are on the laptops by default. If I want to use my TPM, the TPM chip on my laptop, I need to do it after the fact that I've encrypted my drive after the install. It should just be done at install, store the key on my NTPM and call it a day. I know there are some people that may think, oh, now you're just booting up and automatically decrypting your drive. And there probably when you add another step in there, maybe at your home directory isn't decrypted until you type in your password, whatever. I don't know. Still something that does need to be solved. The experience on Linux when it comes to encryption is terrible. 
and and it, again, this goes back to to the fundamental thesis of this episode is that Linux management, including encryption management, is data center focused. I am going to go a step further and say disk encryption on Linux is the worst experience of any platform anywhere, barring BSD. BSD is probably worse because there are three big problems with disk encryption on Linux. The first is you have to do it at install time. You're kind of it's kind of hard to do it afterwards. You don't have a functioning graphical environment when you are doing when you're entering in your passphrase, which means if you are a poor soul who has decided that they are not using the English language or they're using a keyboard layout that doesn't match the default, you are screwed. That is something I haven't thought about. I know people who rely on input method editors to type in their in their natural language, which means that doing disk encryption passphrases is essentially impossible because they cannot type something naturally at early boot, because unlike Windows and, uh, well, actually, I'll take a step back. Windows is weird. Windows has a completely weird process for doing this. But Mac OS, you have full desktop services when you're, when you're, when you're decrypting the disk. And the third problem with, with the way disk encryption works on Linux is that it's just not integrated into anything. It's a discrete piece and, and like nothing knows about what happens when you're using it. And so you can get into weird situations where you may have like not successfully decrypted it or you may have released the, uh, you may have put the data back at rest while the system is still kind of up. And so things break. I I was doing something on my 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 new laptop, which is full disk encrypted as I'm required to do. And I nearly accidentally bricked my laptop because, because when I was doing a particularly sensitive operation, somehow the disk encryption went back to being in rest mode, which means the disk went back to being encrypted and the key just went poof. I wound up having the computer lock up and not do anything. And the fans spin up for an hour and the displays show up with blackness so that it was just completely useless. And eventually I was like, well, if it's not doing anything now, it's never going to do it again. So I turned off the computer by hard powering it off, turning it back on and being very careful about not closing the lid on the laptop and using it like a laptop for a little bit so that I could unlock the device because apparently I cannot use my keyboard through my dock during decryption because Thunderbolt is not engaged at early boot either. And so there's a whole lot of little problems like that that make for a very poor experience and make me despise full disk encryption on Linux right now. There is no reason it should be this bad. Even for data centers, it shouldn't be this bad because a lot of data center centric FDE, FDE being full disk encryption, is done through network based authentication, they don't think about these problems anymore. Back in the, the time when, when Lux was first created, it was like 2001 or something like that, 2003 or four or something. I forget. It's like 20 years ago. We didn't have any of these things. So people actually worked really hard on trying to make this experience work. But after some point, it changed from being like, you need to make sure that you can do a local experience that works reliably to, eh, screw it. We'll just do it through a network authentication or some other thing. Now, for what it's worth, the way that I think it works on Macs is that the secure enclave encrypts both the root APFS container and the user container. However, the user data container is decrypted using your password for unlocking the computer, un for logging in. So it's double encrypted. Whereas the operating system container, which again is static and read-only, partially read-only, caveat supply. That is encrypted purely with the secure enclave. On Windows, I believe the way that this works is that it does um, BitLocker block encryption for the whole volume with the TPM. There are special NTFS features that let it portion, portion out the user profile directory because for a long time now, Microsoft has centralized all of the user data into C users, username, including application data and stuff like that. Because it used to be strewn all over the place, now it's all in one place. And that allows them to do things like 
actually have a different decryption key for parts of the disk and do it all in, in a consistent way. And so they do stuff like that. Again, not too versed on how disk encryption, disk decryption and encryption works on Windows. That's my understanding of how it works. Don't throw tomatoes at me if I'm slightly wrong. I'm more familiar with the Mac one because I'm a Mac owner as well, and I've like fiddled with it a fair bit while I've been trying to figure out how to improve Linux stuff. As I always say, any hate mail goes to michael at tuxdigital.com. Right. Let them know how you feel. The encryption story is not good on Linux because, and I think this comes back to what I was saying earlier, way back when we were talking about the consumer space and the enthusiast space. People don't care. And because people don't care, nothing improves. People don't, people who have money don't care because they think there is no value in it. It does. Everything does. If you want Linux on the desktop to succeed, if you really believe in free software and open source, you've got to put money and muscle and mind to all of it. You got to make it happen. But right now, that's where the state of things are. And until we're making incremental improvements, more Linux laptops are sold every day. The more of those that are sold by Lenovo and HP and Dell and whatever, and also the lovely Linux centric vendors like Tuxedo and Slimbook and like System76. That improves the things. It brings more mind share, it brings more attention to it. It gets more people interested in doing stuff. Then the next phase is like convincing people that it's worth doing something. Because if you don't, con if you can't convince people that it's worth doing something, it ain't worth doing. Bill, I know we've kind of talked about this. You brought up collide which hits on i want to say the complete policy at least it it informs a user you're out of compliance so again similar to fleet dm i know you deal with mdm day in day out when you're working with your clients what are they looking for when it comes to mdm and when you think about it what do you think it could be missing just knowing what you know about current management tools today, what's missing in the Linux space? Well, we go back to apps. I mean, one of the, you think about what different functions an MDM serves for an organization. We talk about mainly settings, password management, user management, sometimes printer management, like Microsoft Intune can deploy printers. It can also deploy packages through either the Windows Store or you can upload your own custom MSIs. If we were going to deploy software through an MDM towards Linux, and Intune's kind of starting to build a relationship with Ubuntu for managing Ubuntu laptops, how do we make that a more universal experience for Linux in a, in a broad sense? You need a universal package system to do that, because obviously we can't deliver RPM packages to Debian-based systems, and we can't deliver Debian packages to RPM-based systems, nary the two shall meet. So I think the biggest hole we have right now is, first off, can we get that package to be delivered in a universal sense, whether that's flat pack, snap, app image, take your pick. Personally, I would think flat pack is the best suited option for that. Not all packages are built in flat pack. Microsoft Edge, I'll pick on that for example. Maybe you want your organization to use Microsoft Edge because of the unified Office 365 experience when they sign in for their work apps. That can easily be deployed via a flat pack, wherein maybe something else can't. So I feel like getting the apps right the first time around is where MDM has a broader chance of succeeding in Linux. Neil, you talked about encryption, getting the encryption experience to improve. I feel like if there was something in line like Cockpit or Fleet DM or a way of centrally managing encryption keys, then a Linux-based MDM becomes a lot more attractive to organizations. One of the things that I've been thinking about when it comes to this is a lot of what gets solved for Linux desktop comes from innovation in the data center. There's now requirements coming for Linux servers basically Linux devices. Now we're calling this Edge. I've been thinking, does this help? Will this help solve some of this? We'd we'll be able to start thinking about using TPM bound encryption by default. I'm thinking also thinking about remote provisioning, whether that's utilizing FIDO to exchange a key to go, okay, now you can pull down a corporate image or corporate package to turn your system into a corporate device or however you want to handle it. And also remote wipe. That's another use case that's in Edge, being able to wipe a device remotely and then also be able to re reprovision it uh, if needed. So that's 
So I'm wondering, can can we get there through that as well? In a previous episode, we talked about all the things that you can just pull off the shelf to handle this. I'll just put that in the show notes. Well, something to think about, Brandon, is that baked right into cockpit, if you use the image builder that's baked into Fedora into cockpit, one of the things that you can create in your blueprint, one of the settings that you can set up is FIDO device onboarding. And to me, that that shows me that there are fundamentals in place to make this work. I feel like there's different fundamentals that are all there, but they're all siloed and they're not interconnected in some way, shape or form. That's the problem. And I think it'll get there. It's just uh, as we evolve the use cases and edge will also help us solve the use cases for for a laptop style device not just a a computer at a base of a radio tower there's a lot to to go in there it's just how's that experience going to look or can it can you take all that together and turn it into a good experience not just for the enterprise but for everyone well also for what it's worth i know um bill you mentioned things about the universal package format thing. Um, I'd actually like to point out that it's not necessary that you you necessarily need a universal package format. You need a universal package management API. You need it to be very easy to integrate no matter what the underlying platform is. And actually for like the past decade, we've had one. So in the Linux desktop space, one desktop technology we've got is called Package Kit. And it abstracts the different package systems and gives you a, a simplified API that you can use for stuff like this. Now, not all the backends for all the different distros are in the same level of shape or or whatever, but that's largely because of the lack of investment in the last few years that we were just talking about um, just a few minutes ago. But it's not like we haven't tried to build these things um, to make it easier to do stuff like this. The question is, do people know that they're there to pull all the pieces together to make a successful solution? I think what we're coming to the conclusion is that they know they don't. They don't know that it's there. And so nobody's trying because they think that they have to solve all the problems when, in fact, there's a lot less problems that you have to solve, a lot fewer that you have to solve, and the, the ones that are actually left are the ones that that really need someone to care about. Could you take that API that you're talking about and use some sort of integration with Ansible or Salt to then deliver packages to systems that are enrolled in a Salt Master or via an Ansible playbook? Is that sure. another piece of this? So an important piece of Linux uh, of Linux management is having a consistent usable, useful, and simple way to describe what a system should look like. And I think I would argue that Ansible is probably one of the better options out there that could fit this. There aren't a lot of automation modules or Ansible modules around desktop-ish stuff, but building those is just a matter of somebody caring and doing it. And then once you have them, then yeah, you could absolutely do this kind of stuff. I I see Ansible potentially serving as essentially a superset of what you could do with group policy and stuff like that on Windows, because not only can you declare the state of what things should look like, you can also declare other things. You can declare like actions and you can declare configuration states and you can declare software transactions or network overrides or create communication layers and things like that. There's a lot of stuff you can do with a tool like Ansible. It's formalizing it and turning it into something that is approachable for this kind of use case is what's missing right now for for that. And 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 even Ansible already has an abstraction for a lot of these things that we we've, we've been talking about. It's just again, it needs to be formalized and simplified and 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 assembled in a way that makes it approachable. I'm looking forward to seeing your your GitHub submissions for this, Neil. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you are able to create in all your spare time and reviewing that source code with you over a hot steak and a cold beverage. Man, you have a lot of high hopes for me in my spare time. One of the things I also want to point out, this is for everyone in the community. You can see when Apple started to gain mindshare. And this is why I 
so passionate about this and why I now see this management problem as the new barrier. I want to talk about applications, but at, at this point in this recording, I don't think we have enough time to talk about application development and stuff like that. That'll be another episode. One of the reasons why I'm so passionate about MDM, management in general, again, from the consumer space all the way to enterprise, is because th this hockey stick move with Apple laptops in the enterprise space. Now, keep this in mind. From 2002, even well after Apple has switched to Intel on the Mac, to the, so basically from 2002 to 2010, Apple, Macintosh, computers in the enterprise were about under 5% market share. Over 95% is Windows. And there's obviously some with other. And that's going to be like some legacy Unix workstations or OS2, whatever. It's just some, a bunch of legacy stuff in that period of time. It goes from 5% to 20% after Apple sanctioning an MDM solution to manage Macs with all the proper support that enterprises want. It goes from 5%, I believe it's now at 30%. I'll have a link in the show notes to what right now Linux usage in the enterprise is under 2%. And that is ranging from high performance workstations to the everyday user on, on a on a laptop. So it's under 2%, depending on who where you look. I, I've even seen it less than 1%. I really do think looking at the surveys that the the developer surveys mac usage has dropped among developers around among developers in general i think there's a window here and the only way to to, to take advantage of this window to get linux usage up make it the year of the linux desktop make it the never the year of the linux desktop go away that's the way i've always fe felt about when people say that i'm like it no it's not it will never be the year of the linux desktop unless we solve these fundamental issues the current fundamental issue to driving linux desktop adoption is management you want to get it to that get that hockey stick market share like apple did with with the mac in 2010 2011 solve the management problem. There's my call to action for everyone in the community. Thank you for listening to The Pseudo Show, where business meets open source.